one way to think about um, uh, a physical mathematical theory, uh, a theory is it's, it's a compression of, of the universe um, and a, a data compression. So you know you have these petabytes of observations. You like to compress it to a model which you can describe in five pages and specify a certain number of parameters. And if it can fit to reasonable accuracy, you know uh, almost all of, of your observations. I mean, the more compression that you make, the better your theory. In fact, one of the great surprises of our universe and of everything in it is that it's compressible at all. That's the yeah. unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Yeah, Einstein had a quote like that. The, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Right, and not just comprehensible. You can do an equation like E equals MC squared. There is actually a, some mathematical possible explanation for that. Um, so there's this phenomenon in mathematics called universality. So many complex systems at the macro scale are coming out of lots of tiny interactions at the macro scale. And normally because of the common form of explosion, you would think that uh, the macro scale equations must be like infinitely, exponentially more complicated than, than the, uh, the macro scale ones. And they are if you want to solve them completely exactly. Like if you want to model um, all the atoms in a box of, of air, uh, that's like Avogadro's number is humongous. Right? There's a huge number of particles. If you actually have to track each one, it would be ridiculous. But certain laws emerge at the microscopic scale that almost don't depend on what's going on at the macro scale, or, or only depend on a very small number of parameters. So if you want to model a gas um, of you know quintillion particles in a, in a box, you just need to know its temperature and pressure and volume and a few parameters, like five or six. And it models almost everything you, you need to know about these 10 to 23 or whatever particles. Um, so. We we have um, we we don't understand universality anywhere near as we would like mathematically. But there are much simpler toy models where we do um, have a good understanding of why universal universality occurs. Um, uh, most basic one is is the central limit theorem that explains why the bell curve shows up everywhere in nature. That so many things are distributed by uh, what's called a Gaussian distribution, a famous bell curve. Uh, there's now even a meme with this curve. And even the meme applies broadly. There's yeah. the universality to the meme. Yeah, yes, you can go meta uh, <laughs> if you like. But there are many, many processes. For example, you, you can take lots of independent um, random variables and average them together um, uh, in, in various ways. You, you can take a simple average or more complicated average. And we can prove in various cases that that these, these bell curves, these Gaussians, emerge. And it is a satisfy, satisfying explanation. Um, sometimes they don't. Um, so so if you have many different inputs and they're all correlated in some s systemic way, then you, you can get something very far from a bell curve show up. Uh, and this is also important to know when the statistical limit fails. So universality is not a 100% reliable thing to rely on. That, um, um, that the global financial crisis was a, a famous example of this. Uh, people thought that uh, um, mortgage de defaults um, uh, had this sort of um, Gaussian type behavior that that if you if you ask if a population of of, of uh, you know hundred thousand Americans with mortgages, you ask what what proportion of them were default in their mortgages. Um, if everything was decorrelated, it would be a nice bell curve, and, and like you, you can you can manage risk with options and derivatives and so forth, and um, and it is a very beautiful theory. Uh, but if there are systemic shocks in the economy uh, that can push everybody to default at the same time, uh, that's very non Gaussian behavior. Um, and uh, this wasn't fully accounted for <laughs> in uh, 2008. <laughs> um, now I think there's some more awareness that uh, this is a uh, systemic risk is actually a, a much bigger issue. And uh, just because the model is pretty uh, and nice, uh, it may not match reality. Uh, so, so the mathematics of working out what models do is really important. Um, but um, also the, the science of validating when the models uh, fit reality and when they don't. Um, I mean, that you need both. Um, and, but mathematics can help because it, it can, it, it, uh, for example, these central limit theorems, it, it told you that, that if you have certain axioms like like, like uh, non-correlation, that if all the inputs were not correlated to each other, um, then you have these Gaussian behaviors so things are fine. It, it tells you where to look for weaknesses in the model. So if you have a mathematical understanding of the central limit theorem and someone proposes to use these Gaussian copulas or whatever to, to model um, default risk, um, if you're mathematically um, trained, you would say, okay, but what are the systemic correlation between all your inputs? And so then the, then you can ask the economists, you know, how how, how much of a risk is that? Um, and then you can, you can you can go look for that. So there's always this this, uh, this synergy between science and, and mathematics.